All right. Amen. Well, we are uh, again in Matthew chapter number six. And just a quick reminder, we are going through the uh, Sermon on the Mount. We're reading the Sermon on the Mount, we're studying it, and what we're finding is it's vastly different than what the world tells us it means, right? If you've been here for the last couple weeks, that should be one thing you've taken away, is that it's not like Jesus is preaching the Sermon on the Mount, and then all of a sudden it just changes everything. It's all about love, all about tolerance, can't hate anything, can't hate anyone, uh, you no know judgment, right? You're not seeing any of that there. Everything that he taught, everything that he is teaching that we're going to go over is throughout the Word of God, okay? It's consistent. The Bible has continuity from the first page all the way through the last page. There are no contradictions. Now, if you would keep your place there in Matthew 6, but go to Proverbs chapter number 15. Proverbs chapter number 15. Now, that's the second week in a row that we've read the chapter. And if you're like me, you may have noticed this phrase come up a few times in chapter number 6, which is, take no thought. Okay, you see Jesus say that five different times. Take no thought for the morrow. Take no thought. We're going to talk about that this morning. What does that mean? What are the mechanics behind that? And the title of the sermon is this, When Thought Whispering Goes Wrong. When Thought Whispering Goes Wrong. You might be thinking, what in the world does that mean? Well, who's ever heard of a lion whisperer? Right? Somebody who goes out in the jungle and hangs out with lions and claims to be friendly with them. Uh, there's, there's people who, who do stuff like that, and they're successful some of the time. Uh, there's people that, that are called the shark whisperers that go out and dive with tiger sharks. I'm serious. There's videos of it, and people are down there trying to pet these things. You know? and if you keep scrolling, you'll find one uh, of a person getting bit. <laughs> these things are dangerous. Just because you can do it or get away with it for a while, you have to remember those things are still wild animals, still a beast. And the thing about our thoughts and where our thoughts come from okay, is very similar. So the idea here, obviously... Uh, the, the whole point of the last part of the sermon, because really we're going to focus on Matthew 6, 19 through 34. And it's about taking control of your thoughts, taking control of them, because if you don't take control of your thoughts, your thoughts will take control of you. So we're going to learn about understanding that and how to exactly do that. Um, I've got a little example here. Actually, I wanted to go over. i got to remember to put this back in my tool bag. But just while you're going to Proverbs 15, I wanted to give you a quick illustration here of how this is going to work this morning. So this thing I'm holding up here, okay? What this is called, it's called an NTC thermistor, a negative temperature coefficient. It's just a fancy word for temperature sensor, okay? Now, the cost of this thing ranges anywhere from 20 to 70, 80 dollars, okay? And what this thing does is it reads temperature, okay? And the way that it does that is this will be, anybody in here who has a computer on their refrigerator, a computer in your dishwasher or your washing machine or your dryer, or any appliance that has a thermistor of some sort. They don't all look like this, but they all have one, okay? And basically, this is how this works, okay? This sits in your appliance. Let's just talk about a fridge, okay? This measures temperature. So as, te as the temperature inside of your refrigerator goes up, the resistance goes down, okay? So what that means, it's basically inside of this white little piece here is a strip of platinum and a bunch of different metals and packing material, okay? And what that's designed to do is designed to slow the flow of electricity that's flowing through these wires, okay? And as that, so basically when, okay, when the heat goes up, so if I were to hold this, right, it's gonna get hot. The resistance is gonna go down. It's kinda like people. It's kinda like most patriots today, right? <laughs> Seriously, when, when, when the heat goes up, Right? When it gets too hot in the kitchen, the resistance goes down. Yeah, right. Right? Think about it. When everything's cool, everything's smooth, the economy is going good, there's no persecution. Right? People are like, oh man, if they come try to take my guns, if they come try to do this, I'm going to blow up, I'm going to do this, we're going to have a tea party revival, we're going to do all this crazy stuff. Right? And then the government comes out and says, well, we have nukes, we'll just blow you up. That's what Joe Biden said. Right. And the patriots are like, right? their resistance goes down. Right? That, I mean, that's just how most people are. <laughs> but that's just a good way to kind of remember how this works, okay? But anyways, going back to this. So what this does, again, is it reads temperature. So as the temp goes up in your refrigerator or your freezer, the resistance goes down. And those electrons start flowing faster through the wires, and it goes back to your computer, which is your brain or the heart. It's actually both. Okay, you got a big motherboard on your appliance, and this thing tells that computer, hey, it's too warm, and so then your computer says, okay, well, we need to turn the compressor 
compressor up, or maybe we need to go into defrost or we need to open and close this, this little shutter or this damper inside my appliance. So your motherboard, which is about five, $600, is making a decision based off of this little tiny piece. The reason why I'm bringing this up is because in the world of appliance repair, uh, HVAC, whatever uh, you might be into, this is often overlooked. I mean, look how small this is, right? Inside of your refrigerator, you're not gonna open it up and see this, okay? Because it's usually hidden. It's usually a small little plastic cover with a few slots over it, and it's just tucked away. You never think about it. It's the same thing with our thought process, right? We have all these issues, and we have all these problems, and these battles, these internal struggles, and a lot of times we're just like, man, what in the world is going on? I can't put my finger on it. I feel like I'm doing all the right things. But one thing that is often overlooked are the eyeballs, okay, which is the gateway into the heart and into the mind. It's the same thing with this piece of equipment here. And so basically that, hopefully that kind of, I don't know, helps out a little bit, kind of illustrate what we're going to be talking about today. And just to further prove that, you're in Proverbs 15. I want you to look at verse number 30. Look at what the Bible says. It says, the light of the eyes rejoiceth the heart, and a good report maketh the bones fat. Okay, now keep something there if you would, because we're going to come back to it at the end of the sermon. But I want you to think about this for a second. What does the beginning of verse 30 say? It says, the light of the eyes rejoiceth the heart. Okay, who's ever gotten bad news or who's ever had someone try to show you something that's not wholesome, that's not good at work? Like, hey, look at this on my phone. You look like, whoa, what in the world was that? Right, that doesn't rejoice the heart. That gets you angry. Okay, so what when you say, what in the world are you talking about here? Well, kind of like how this temperature sensor, right, sends signals back to the brain of your refrigerator or your dishwasher, whatever it is, and it makes decisions based off that, off of that reasoning. Well, when this thing quits or this thing goes out of range, okay, because these little sensors, they're pretty tough. They don't often fail. But the way that they go bad is they don't, uh, they just get to a point to where they're just not as strong anymore. They're not able to slow down that flow of electrons. And so they'll go out of range. So you'll get to a, uh, you know, maybe you have like uh, vegetables or something like that freezing inside of your crispers, right? Who's ever had that? I'm sure everybody in here has had that. Or maybe the display on the front of your fridge says, it says 53, but it actually feels like it's 23 inside of there. A lot of times it's a result of that, okay? And a lot of times what's wrong with us is what we're watching, what we're listening, what we're subjecting ourselves to our sensors, the light of our eyes. This is why it's so important for the believer to read the Word of God, to be in God's house, to be around God's people frequently so that we can send good signal back to the brain and down into the heart and have that rejoicing that Proverbs 15 is talking about. And that's really the gist of what we're going to be studying in the last half of Matthew chapter number 6. So again, keep your place there, but go to Proverbs, or I'm sorry, go back to Matthew 6. Go back to Matthew chapter number 6. You know, and again, this is something that applies to all of us. We all have to battle our thoughts. If you're honest with yourself, you know that what I'm about to say is true, and I say this all the time. If God said, hey, I'm going to come visit Shield of Faith Baptist Church, and I'm going to open up everyone's thoughts for two minutes, and we could read each other's minds, we'd never talk to each other again. You know that to be true, <laughs> right? And there'd be divorces, there'd be just all kinds of issues if that were the case, right? And so I say that to get your mind right and to get your mind focused on this very true fact, we have a wicked heart. But the Bible also says we have the mind of Christ. If you're saved, he's given you a new man inside of you, and obviously that's the solution, okay? But again, who's ever heard this phrase? You know, I just really need to get something off my chest or something so-and-so is always on my mind, right? We're going to talk about that this morning. I'm going to tell you and show you how to deal with that. Now, the Bible talks so much about our thoughts, so much about the heart, so much about the mind. It's going to be impossible for me to cover it all this morning. But I believe that sermons like this, at least, I don't know, two, three times a year, are probably very valuable and very important for all of us to go through. So... Uh, if you're like, man, you talked about similar stuff like this six months ago, hey, just rejoice and understand that we need a review. It's time for a review because that's where we're at in the Bible, okay? Um, so again, quick review. We're in Matthew chapter number six. Last week, what did we talk about? We talked about doing prayer, talked about doing fasting, talked about doing things for what? For glory, glory of man, doing things to be seen of men. What's the consequence of that? What was the result of that? 
Yeah, you got no reward. Your reward is in that moment when you get that glory. It's not a good thing. And that was the gist of what we talked about last Sunday. But let's just look uh, at verse number 19 here. Look what Jesus says. Matthew 6, number, uh, verse number 19 says this, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. Okay? And remember, he's saying that right after telling us how we ought to do our alms, how we should pray, how we should fast. Right? We should do those things for humility. We should do those things to help ourselves, to help our brethren, and to further the kingdom of God. And he says, hey, and here's another reason. Don't be laying up for yourselves treasures upon earth. Okay? There's nothing wrong with getting a pat on the back once in a while. There's nothing wrong with getting more subscribers as long as those things don't have you. That's the issue. That's what we're dealing with today. We need to make sure that we are doing these things for the Lord, okay? for the kingdom of God. Now look at verse 20. He says, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. And he's going to tell us how to continue doing that this, uh, this morning. Look what it says next. It says, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Again, this is an often overlooked, valuable piece of information that a lot of Christians today just don't understand because we live in the physical. We live in the here and now, right? We get that instant satisfaction when we get that raise or we get that promotion or we do something good, but the Lord's telling us, hey, don't forget, you will be in eternity much longer than you will have ever been alive on this planet. So it would be wise for us to understand that we have a better plan than a 401k in heaven. We have a better opportunity in heaven to store up riches because no one's going to come along and take those from you. Who's going to break into heaven and take your treasures? I mean, think about that. No one is going to do that. The only person who can lose their rewards, lose their treasures is you, the individual. No one's going to do that for you. Okay? And what he's about to go over next is the actual key, the actual way that we cement down and we protect those rewards that we're storing up. It all goes back to having a strong mind, back to being unmovable, not being double-minded, not being like, oh, you know, one minute I'm on fire, the next minute I'm cold, or worse than that, being lukewarm. Okay? So he's going to tell us how to do that, and it all goes back to the eyes, the brain, and the heart. Look at verse 21. Look what he says next. It says, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You might be thinking, like, what in the world does that mean? Like, how does that even work? Where your treasure is, there's your heart. You're talking about the physical, you know, heart, the, the, the one that's beating. You're talking about the brain. What are you talking about? Well, if you would, go to Proverbs chapter number 23. Proverbs chapter number 23. And what we're going to do now is we're going to kind of break down some mechanics of how this process works. How do the eyes, how do the mind, how do the heart, how do these things work inside of us, and why is this so important for us to understand? So if you would, look at Proverbs chapter number 23 in verse number 7. Very familiar verse. We've talked about this extensively in the past, but let's look at it again. Proverbs 23, look at verse number 7. The Bible says, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. We'll have to come back another day and work the last half of that verse. But I want you to look at the beginning of that verse there. What does it say? For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Okay, this should cut everyone right down the middle, right to the bone. Because a lot of people that are filled with pride in church, a lot of people that are filled with pride and that are very arrogant, you know, a lot of times they think to themselves, like, man, I'm doing really good. You know, I'm holy. I I'm actually sanctified. I'm actually doing all this great stuff. But really, if the abundance of those thoughts in their heart are prideful, right, they're doing things to be seen of men, they're doing things to get glory from man, then guess what? They are actually pride. They are prideful. Okay? It doesn't matter how they see themselves, how they want to reason it. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So for example, if you think that you're good for nothing, you just think that you're weak. Oh, my past. Oh, this. Oh, I did this. Oh, I messed up this this week. You know, I'm garbage. Guess what? Then that's what you're going to wind up being. Think about it. If you wake up every single day and you're like, you know, I'm just not worth putting on this new man, which was given to me freely by Christ, then guess what? You're going to be that old man that day. Right. As you think in your heart, so are you, okay? That is going to be very important as we go throughout this sermon. Now, if you would go to Luke chapter number 24. Luke chapter number 24. 
So you say, what are you talking about? Well, Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So what is valuable to you, which you have decided is worthy to you, that is where your heart will be. That is where your emotions will be centered. And the main point of the sermon this morning is this, your treasures troll your thoughts. Your treasures troll your thoughts. See, what does it mean to be a troll? Or what, what, what's a troll? Well, I'm not talking about some mythology, right? I'm not talking about the little dwarfs, you know, with the, the hair that people manipulate or whatever, or giants or whatever. No, I'm talking about the trolls who've been attacking our church. <laughs> you know, think about those types of trolls. What do they do? They try to instigate us, don't they? They try to instigate us and to get us to do something illegal so that they can take legal action against us. There's online trolls all the time on our channel. You know, they'll say something just to get a rise, just to get, a, you know, just to get us to do something to instigate. Well, guess what? your treasures will do that to you. If you have the wrong treasures, if your goal in life, you know what? I just really want to be super mega powerful and super mega successful in this life. I want to be a pro basketball player. You know, guess what? That takes you forsaking church. That takes you forsaking the kingdom of God. Now, obviously, you're not going to lose your salvation because once you're saved, you're always saved. He's the one that did all the work, right? But guess what? You're throwing away all of those rewards when you decide that is going to be your treasure. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So the, what Jesus is trying to tell us, hey, your treasures troll your thoughts. So think about this. If you treasure the word of God, you treasure the fact that you're saved, you understand that you were lost, you could never save yourself, and you reflect on that and you decide, you know what, that is my treasure. This book is my treasure. This book has the answers to everything in life that is wrong, everything that I need to do to make it here, everything that I need to do to be successful even in eternity, guess what? That is going to troll your thoughts in a good way. That is going to drive you to do what is right. So let's talk about this. Your treasures troll your thoughts, okay? Now, the, the question is, and a lot of atheists will say, well, you know, the Bible teaches that we don't think with our brains. They'll say stuff like that. I've had that out sewing. You know, well, I'm studying neurology down at BSU and, you know, or whatever it is. And, you know, the Bible actually teaches that, you know, that you only reason in your heart. The Bible says a lot about reasoning in your heart. But does the Bible neglect the brain? Does the Bible neglect the mind? That's ridiculous to say something like that. But let's talk about the physical heart for a second. What's the deal with the heart? The physical heart, what does it do? Well, it's the center of your life. You cut the heart, you die. That heart stops beating, your body falls over, and you're done. Now, think about this. What if your heart goes out of range? It's not working optimally. How does your body react? Not too well. You start to have issues. You start to have problems, okay? It's the same thing with the heart that the Bible's talking about here, okay? Now, before we read Luke chapter 24, verse 38, just listen to this. I just want to give you some examples, okay? So what's the deal with the heart. What's the deal with the organ? Well, everybody in here, I, think, I don't think anybody in here would disagree with this, right? When you get feelings, you feel it like in this area. You kind of feel it in this area, don't you? You kind of feel, you know, your emotions around here, right? What does science say? They say, well, that's cellular memory, you know? Here's, here's a, funny, a funny fact as I was studying for this. I was watching these videos of people that got heart transplants. Don't get me asked, don't ask me how I got off on that, but I did. And I, I thought it to be actually pretty valuable. Because a lot of people that get heart transplants will have these unexplained desires, right? They'll be like, you know, I used to hate lasagna, and now all of a sudden I crave lasagna all the time. Or I used to just be pretty cool and calm and collective, and since my heart transplant, I feel like I'm always angry. I feel like, you know, these different emotions that I didn't have before, and I'm having this mental heart warfare. This is a real phenomenon. Go look it up. It's interesting the things that people will talk about, you know? And, and what is that? Science says, well, that's cellular memory. Okay. Well, actually, no, that's how God designed you. That's, that's your heart. Now, here's some illustrations of mental and emotional abilities of the heart. We don't have time to take a look at these. I just want you to listen. So Exodus 4, 14, part of the verse says this, he will be glad in his heart. Okay. You feel emotions in your heart. That's what it's saying. Exodus 4, 20, he will harden his heart. Okay. Remember when God was telling Moses, he's saying, hey, I want you to go to Pharaoh and I want you to say this. Okay. What did Pharaoh say? I don't know the Lord. Pharaoh rejected the Lord first, and then God hardened his heart, okay? But Pharaoh 
made his own choice. In his own heart, he reasoned by himself and said, you know what? I don't want to worship the God of the Hebrews. I don't want him in my life. I don't want his rules. I don't want his statutes. And I certainly don't want to let these Hebrew people go. I like their work. It's cheap, so on and so forth. Levit uh, Leviticus 19.17 says this. It says, thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Okay? So the Bible is very clear that we store emotions, we reason, we have feelings in our heart. I believe that that's in this part of the body. Okay, in, in, in your actual heart. That's, that's what it's saying here. Okay? And, and to further prove that, let's take a look at something here. Luke chapter 24, look at verse number 38. This is going to explain to us where do our thoughts come from. Well, here's one uh, place that our thoughts come from. Look at verse 38. So Jesus teaching, uh, of course, this is after the resurrection. He's appeared to the disciples and they're just like, I don't know what's going on. What in the world? Look what he says. And he said unto them, verse 38, Why are ye troubled? And don't miss this. And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Think about that. Why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Why is Jesus asking the disciples this? Because it's meant to be a rhetorical question. He wants them to know the answer. He wants them to understand, Hey, if you're going to continue to be a disciple for me, you need to understand this concept. Why do thoughts arise in your heart? And furthermore, why do you take them? Okay, we're going to talk about that later. Why do you take these thoughts? Go to Deuteronomy chapter number 4. Deuteronomy chapter number 4. You know, today a lot of times, the, the most common question that I get asked today by Christian people, and even people that aren't saved, is, hey, how do I get these thoughts in my mind? How do they come into my mind? How does that all work? Because, like, I'm thinking these thoughts I shouldn't be thinking, and this and that. And this is a great question, and I love this question because I love to help people out, you know, but the, the issue is, you know, if you go to science, what are they going to do? Well, they're going to pump you full of drugs. You know, that may mask the symptoms, but it's never going to solve the true issue, right? Because it's not just a brain issue. It's a heart issue. Why did you, I mean, think about it. Jesus said, why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Does anybody in here know a physician that will give you medication for your heart to help your anxiety or to help your schizophrenia or whatever you have, your emotions? No, they're all geared to go into the brain to change the chemicals and to produce a reaction, Right? See, the Bible's way ahead of science. The Bible's way ahead of big pharma today. You don't find pharmacies, you don't find doctors doing that, do you? So what's the cure? What's the solution? Well, it should be pretty simple. Take care of your heart. I mean, think about it. You know, there have been studies after study of people that exercise frequently, and I'm guilty of not doing it myself. You know, I work a lot, I do this. You know, I don't have a lot of time, but people that exercise tend to be happier. They tend to be in a better mood. Who's ever heard of a runner's high? Right? It comes from that blood just flowing and, and you know, uh, that, that heart pumping, that heart getting stronger. Okay? I'm telling you, people that exercise, I mean, think about athletes. Okay? Think about people that are athletes that are dedicated, that are disciplined. Right? A lot of times they have good hearts. You know, in, in, in some circumstances, it, it, you know, if we could get to them at a certain age before the pride sets in, you know, hopefully they would be able to better understand the Bible and understand these concepts, but that's a subject for another day. So, again, how, do, how does this thought get in my mind? That's the question that we get asked all the time. So you are in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4. Look at verse 39. Deuteronomy 4, look at verse 39. It says this, Know there... Or know therefore this day, and consider it in thine heart that the Lord, he is God in heaven above and upon the earth beneath, there is none else. That's the question for humanity, right? That's why we go soul winning. That's why we go and knock on people's doors to get them to think about this question. Where will you go when your heart stops? Where will you go when you die? And here's a good piece of information for you that you guys at... Uh, go out and you talk to people and you knock on their doors, you need to start developing some discernment. You need to start understanding when it's only bouncing around in the head and they're not actually feeling it. Because if they don't consider it in their heart, you're wasting your time. You are wasting your time. You are wasting the kingdom of God's time. Go to Isaiah chapter number 6. And actually, when you really study this out, you're going to see that, you know, thinking, understanding, considering, meditating, pondering, you know, these things don't come from the mind, meaning the mind is not the source. It's your heart that is the source of these things, right? And it all stems from what? From the eyes, what goes in. 
Kind of like that sensor I showed you, right? That gives inputs to the brain. It gives inputs to, to the heart of the appliance. And then that makes the decisions on how the unit is going to operate. It's the same thing with us. What we subject our eyes to, right? What we allow to come in our eyes, what we allow to come in our ears overwhelmingly will determine ultimately how our heart reasons and the decisions that we are going to make, so on and so forth. Isaiah chapter 6, look at verse number 8. So the Bible says this, and you're going to find this passage in John chapter 12, but look at verse number 8. So God's telling Isaiah a prophecy here, and he says, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. It's kind of interesting here, Isaiah the prophet. What, you know, the question's pondered, you know, from God. The question is, is put out there. Who is going to go and provide this information? Isaiah is just ready. He says, here am I, send me. No double-mindedness, no like, wow, man, if I do this, you know, my friends are going to kind of put me off. And No, he's just like, no, this is the truth. This is what's going to happen. I'm going to go and execute. Look at verse 9. And he said, go and tell this people. Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. See, what in the world does that mean? Well, if you know anything about a lot of the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees, if you've read through the book of John, you've read through especially John chapter number 12, you know a lot of those guys were like Pharaoh, right? They did things to be seen of men. They didn't want Jesus coming along, preaching the Bible, preaching truth, and telling people, hey, it's not about what you're doing, guys. It's not about your carnal ordinances. It's not about your vision. It's about the vision of God. They didn't like that, so they darkened their own hearts, and God said, you know what? Now I'm just going to speak to you in parables so that you cannot be converted. People don't like that, but that's what it says. Look at verse 10. So he says this, Make the heart of this people fat and make their ears heavy. And shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert and be healed. Okay, this is the reason why we go soul winning. This is the reason why the gospel is always the number one thing that the local New Testament church is supposed to be about. Because the world is out there, the devil and his army are out there, and what are they doing? They're trying to make the heart of the people fat. Think about it, that's what the government's trying to do. Right? The government has taken, let's, let's just think about this for a second. The government has taken away the consequences for any sin that the woman does. Right? I'm not trying to pick on the ladies, but you guys know this to be true. Okay? Think about it. What happens in most cases when a woman leaves? She gets alimony, she gets the kids, she gets the child support, all that stuff, right? Does the court system make it easy or hard for her to leave? Easy. Last study I read, which was last week, it said somewhere in the high 80s, 80-something percent of women are the ones to generally leave. It's typically not the man. Somebody knows their statistics. You say, why are you all big on these numbers, and why do you care about this, and why do you write down this, and why do you write down this, why do you measure this, why do you measure that? Because what gets measured gets managed. The problem with that statement, though, is the devil understands that. And so think about it, okay? Typically... And I mean, go read through Esther. What happened when uh, <laughs> King Ahasuerus, what, what, happened, when his, what, what happened when his wife, when, when, when she went crazy? And she's like, I'm going to disobey my husband. Right. Got, a new wife. Got a new wife. Right? And all the people in the, their government were like, hey, we can't, allow, we can't allow this precedent to be set. Because it's going to just spread like wildfire throughout the kingdom. And all the women are going to be telling their husbands what to do. And they're going to be bossing them around. Right? Well, what happens today, again, when a man and a woman that are married go into court and say we want to separate, even if it's the woman's fault, even if she's the one that committed adultery, even if she's, in, and again, I'm not condoning divorce at all, I, I don't believe in that, but I'm just saying, you know, what ultimately happens? Typically, the government says, oh, we're going to make it easy for you. You can go ahead and violate the word of God. You can leave your husband and we will make him pay you. Okay, what do you say, well, what about the single ladies? What does the government do about that? Oh, well, we'll give you free abortion. They'll take away the consequences for your fornication. Think about that. Oh, you, you have a drug and alcohol problem? No problem. We'll, we'll get, put you on a program and we'll, we'll give you, like, instead of food stamps, we'll give you, like, alcohol stamps. We'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll help you out. 
and they'll take away that consequence from them. There is an attack on women today, which is an attack on men, and it all goes back to making the heart of the people fat. Think about all the information that's out there on the, on the internet. I mean, the internet's great. It's where we get to learn a lot of stuff, but the problem, again, with that is the devil's working overtime to make the heart of the people fat with an abundance of information so people are left scratching their head like, I don't know what's true. Is it Joel Osteen that's true? Is it Stephen Furtick that's true? Is it John MacArthur who denies the blood of Christ? Is, is he the one with the right gospel? Who is it? Or this, this Baptist guy that's yelling and screaming about the Bible? What's the truth? Okay, this all goes back to the heart. There is a battle for the heart of the people. The kingdom of darkness knows that. The kingdom of heaven is supposed to know that. And we're supposed to take appropriate action action. Okay, but look at verse 10 again. Make the heart of this people fat and make their ears heavy and shut their eyes. Now, this is a situation here where God's saying, hey, I'm taking these people. They've pushed me too far. And guess what? I'm going to make it so that they cannot be converted. Okay, lest they see with their eyes because that's where it starts and hear with their ears and understand with their heart. You see, I mean, why do you think that in the Gospels we're also told that a lot of times the devil will be there when you're giving someone the Gospel and just, or a devil will be there just pulling that seed right out of the heart. Just, who's ever been giving the Gospel to somebody and it's like they understand for like 10 seconds and all of a sudden they're like, you got to turn from your sins to be saved. And you're like, where did that come from? Like, I just, you just told me you agreed with me. And they're like, I did. Okay, that's a spiritual thing going on there where there's probably a devil there just, boom, plucking that thing out. Now, I'm not saying you just give up and walk away. Obviously, you want to keep attempting and you want to keep trying. But, you know, there ought to come a point where you realize, you know what, maybe this isn't the best time. You know, you're just not getting it, you know, especially after like the fifth and sixth, you know, admonition. You know, I mean, come on. Go to Daniel chapter number two. And then, of course, he says, understand with the heart, convert and be healed. So, again, the idea here is that we go out, we preach people the gospel, we show up with a Bible, Okay, with the Word of God so that they can see it. And obviously we preach it so that they can hear it. And hopefully that it set, settles down in their heart. They reason, they convert, they get healed. That's the idea. That's what we are about. But that process there, I mean, that's, that's our life. That's what all of us who are saved have to deal with. Because after you're saved doesn't mean you got everything right. The only thing that happens after you're saved is now you're saved. <laughs> okay? Now you need to learn. Now you need to understand, hey, now it's time to become a disciple. Hopefully, hopefully that's the goal, right? And you become a disciple by reading, by learning, by fellowshipping and doing all the things that we talk about, not to stay saved because you're always saved. Think about it. He paid the sin debt, not you. He paid the whole debt. So the only thing left for you to do was to accept the free gift. Accept the gift. You're in the family. You're in the hand of God. John chapter 10, it's forever, okay? But in Daniel chapter 2, let's get back on track here and start talking about the mind. So again, what, what does the Bible say about the heart? It's where we consider things. It's where we reason. It's where we, where we feel information. Okay, this is the idea here. This is what the Word of God does. It cuts to the heart. That's why some people will come in here. Right, like a few weeks ago, we had a guy who sat right there, came in here, you know, and he left in a hurry and then started messaging me and all these, you know, cussing me out. And you're like, why, why did he do that? Because he thought the whole sermon was directed to him. I'm like, I wrote that before I even knew you were going to come. It wasn't about you. I'm not, look, I'm not about taking guests and just blowing them up. You know, like, but hey, that's what happens. That's how powerful the Word of God is. Okay, so again, that went to the heart. The Word of God goes to the heart. Things go into our heart. But let's talk about the mind here real quick because science will be like, no, 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 no. It's just all in the mind. It's all about your brains, right? This is why we need to trust like Neil deGrasse Tyson and Elon Musk because they have bigger brains. They just have, they're on a whole nother level. We just need to make sure that they never have a bad day so that that way our lives will be great. Right? This is why we need to worship the professor down at BSU because his brain is just so big. Okay? It's ridiculous. Look at Daniel chapter 2 and verse 29. It says this, As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind. Okay? Now how did that happen? If you know the story, it came through a dream. Right? Things come into our minds. Okay? This, look, this, this is what the world is doing today. They're trying to put thoughts, they're trying to put visions into the minds of our children, aren't they? Why do you think the government's fighting so hard to allow these freaks to come into school so that they can put their wicked imagery into the eyes of our children? Because they know 
then in a lot of them, it's going to go to the mind and down into the heart, and then they have the backing of their wicked parents who endorse that stuff, and the next thing you know, they have a convert. They cannot reproduce, so they have to recruit. But back on track here, Daniel chapter 2, verse 29, he says, As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed. What should come to pass hereafter? And he that revealeth secrets maketh known to thee what shall come to pass. So Daniel's saying, hey, the one in heaven who gave this vision to you, he has allowed me to understand this and to tell you what this means, to confirm this is truth. Look at verse 30. He says, but as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living, but for their sakes that shall make known the interpretation to the king and that thou mightest, don't miss this, know the thoughts of thy heart. So again, the Bible speaks over and over again that we reason, we ponder, we consider things in our heart. Now, if you would, go to Mark chapter number 2. Mark chapter number 2. What did Jeremiah say about the heart? Yeah, it's wicked. It's deceitful. It's wicked. Yep, that's right. Above all things, it is desperately wicked. <clears throat> So again, what are we talking about here? We're ta talking about the heart. We're talking about the mind connection here, okay? Reasoning, which is this mental process. Again, you know, there are tons of people out there that attack the Bible. They attack these creation scientist people, and they say, you know, they can't answer the question of how the Bible ignores the brain. Well, the Bible doesn't ignore the brain. That's ridiculous. What, what, what did Solomon say about the brain or about the head? Now, you're not going to find the word brain in the King James Bible, but he said the eyes of the wise are in the head. He said a wise man's eyes are in his head. Let me just show you what, let me just kind of just give you a picture of, of how this looks. So back to the sensor again, okay? I like this guy because these have caused me more callbacks and caused me to look stupid more times than I care to admit. This little stupid thing right here. Okay, different shapes, different sizes. Now, when I go to somebody's appliance and I have to work on it, you know what I don't do? I don't rely on my gut feeling. I don't rely on how I feel. I just feel like this is gonna be a sensor issue. Someone says, hey, my fridge isn't cooling right. You know, I don't walk in and I'm like, you know, I just feel. And I start like having a heart to heart conversation with this thing, right? You know what I do? A wise man's eyes are in his head. I go back to my training, which went into my head, and I go back to my understanding of reading schematics and electrical diagrams and understanding how circuits work and understanding specifications, and I start taking measurements, and I start to prove whether or not something is true or something is false. Okay, that's what we do as Christians too, right? Somebody comes to us with a doctrine. Somebody comes to us with something we haven't heard before or a person or whatever the case is. What saith the scriptures? Okay? I don't say, oh, you know, I, I just, kindness just rules all. And I know it's true that people are born male or female or human or animal. But for the sake of kindness, I just, I'm just going to have to just, just push that out of the way because it's, it's all about the heart. Okay, that's ridiculous. The Bible talks about both. Okay? So again, that's just one example of how we use our brains, how we use our minds to, to, to understand and to process information. So don't let these scientist type people, and they're not even real scientists, they're, they're, they're bogus scientists, they are fake, they don't understand the Bible, okay? they don't understand it. You know, uh, you're there in Mark chapter 2, for example, just look at verse number 6, what does it say? Look at the last part of the verse, or the middle part of the verse, it says, and reasoning of their hearts, jump down to verse number 8, it says, why reason these things in your heart? Okay? So again, the heart is where people ponder things. Is this true? So when you're learning new information or somebody's teaching you something, you know, it goes through your eyes, it goes into your ears, it goes into your mind, and it goes down into your heart and it bubbles up or it festers there. And you start to ponder, how does this go? How do we reason? How do we understand this information? Okay? It's the same thing when you're at the door with somebody and you're preaching the gospel to them. You're going over the fact, hey, you're a sinner, I'm a sinner. You know, there's someone who paid the debt. Okay, and you're asking them questions. You're trying to get them to understand and to see clearly what the Bible says so that hopefully that word goes down into their heart, sprouts up, and they say, this has got to be the truth. 
Okay, and that's not from you. That's from God. That's from the Bible. But I mean, over and over in the Bible, Luke 5, 22, you don't have to turn there, but it says, why reason ye in your hearts? You'll see this phrase over and over again throughout the Word of God, throughout the Bible. So with that being said, go back to Matthew 6, and let's actually move on and talk about the rest of the sermon today. I just wanted to kind of go over some mechanics. Okay, Thing, the, all that to say this, things go in through the sensors, in through the eyes, Okay, and then you go into the mind and down into the heart, and, and whatever happens, happens. Okay, if you want to make the bulk of that stuff bad or evil, then the bulk of your decisions, the bulk of your actions, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. That is what you will wind up becoming. If you want to be like, you know what, I just envision myself as just this awesome professional athlete, you know what, eventually you're going to forsake God. You're going to forsake the kingdom of God. You're going to forsake the things that we have been called to do. Let me prove that to you. Remember, your treasures troll your thoughts. So if that is what you treasure, if that is what you value, glory of man, to be seen of man, then guess what? That is going to drive your actions. That is going to become who you are. Matthew chapter 6, look at verse 22. Jesus says this. He says, the light of the body is the eye. Well, that's consistent with what we've just studied throughout the, the, the Bible, all these verses we've gone to. That's consistent with Proverbs th uh, 15. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. What does that mean? Does that mean we should close one eye or rip one eye out? Look at verse 23. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? So again, you got two choices. Okay, you can either subject your eyes to being single, or you say, well, again, okay, what, what does that mean? Here's how I like to put it, okay? We all want to have single vision, meaning I'm not seeing two congregations right now. That would be called double vision. Who's here? Who here has ever had something in their eye and you start to kind of like water and you start to see like two of something? Okay? That makes it very difficult for you to navigate, doesn't it? It makes it hard for you to walk. It, but, but spiritually speaking, how does that affect the Christian? How does that affect people? It makes it hard for them to see what's true. I see two of everything. I have double vision, right? We don't want that. We want to get our vision corrected to this single vision. And here's one thing. I said this in Vancouver when I preached a sermon called the extra mile mentality. You know, I said this, that the mentally tough know what they want and continuously pursue it no matter what. That's what Paul did. That's what Peter did. That's what John did. That's what the disciples did. Jesus taught them to be single-minded. He said, hey, get your mind off of all the stuff that you're seeing the Pharisees do. What they're saying is not necessarily the issue, but it's what they do. It's the leaven that they have that you need to be aware of. It's that leaven that's going to puff up and cause you double vision or worse yet, blurry vision. Does that need any explanation? What happens if your vision's blurry? You cannot see correctly. It's so why it matters what church you go to. This is why, you know, when people get up there and they're like, I know people that say you've got to turn from your sins to be saved, but I think they're well-meaning, and that's the other side of the coin, but, you know, we are saved by grace, and they're talking about both. That's not clear. That's not single vision. That's having double vision. Look, it's either one or the other. It's either we're saved by grace through faith, or you're saved by works. It's either human achievement and probation, or it's eternal security and salvation. It's one or the other. You cannot see both. Both cannot be true. So which is it? We want to be single in our vision, okay? And look, the vision's clear. What, what, what's the vision of the church? It's to edify one another and to evangelize the lost. That's why we exist. Look at verse 24. Jesus says this, No man can serve two masters. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Guess what truth that also gives us and also reveals to us? Everyone's going to serve something. That guy who tells you that he's free because he goes to BSU and he can party every weekend and doesn't feel guilty and this and that, guess what? He's still serving man. He's still serving his own lust and his own envy and his own people at that college. Yep. Everyone serves something or someone. I love these people like, oh, I hate religion. And you look on, you're at the door and you're like, 
Oh, you like football? Oh, I love it. I watch every game. You know, I got, I got, you know, season tickets or whatever it is. You know, that's your religion. That's what you value. That's where your treasure's at. And those are the thoughts that you're going to have to choose from to take a hold of. That's what we're up against today. That's what we're up against when we're out there trying to evangelize the lost. Look at verse 25. He says, therefore, so for that reason, therefore I say unto you, and here it is, take what? No thought for your life. Interesting. Why does Jesus keep saying that? Take. Take. He says, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat in the body than raiment? Why does he say that? Take no thought for those things. Because you have a choice. You have the choice. But here's the thing. I think all of us can agree, man, the thought battle, the battle that you and I have inside, it is hard. I mean, look, if you're driving down the street and you see like a, I don't know, maybe you're into some kind of a car and you see that for sale. Look, that thought of you buying that can plague you for weeks. <laughs> you know? I mean, I'm just saying, you know, oh man, I really want to get that new $500 suit, you know. I mean, things like that, look, they can really plague you. And people that, you know, maybe aren't as versed in the Bible, they don't understand these things. They'll have this question like, man, I feel like I just can't get rid of this. Like, is something wrong with me? And it's like, no, I mean, kind of, yes, you'll see that here in a moment. But you have the choice, right? You have the choice. You're going to see in a moment. Those thoughts are always going to be there as long as you have the old man, as long as you have the flesh. You're always going to have those thoughts. Our hearts are wicked and deceitful above all things. I mean, who can know it? Okay? But the problem is, what are you going to take? Are you going to take those thoughts and take them and dwell on them and ponder them and meditate on them and make it your treasure, right? Be careful what you take is the message here. Look at verse 26. It says, Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? <laughs> Boy, this would get Peter pretty upset. See why Peter hates the Bible? Why these liberals hate the Word of God? What is Jesus saying here? We are more valuable than the creatures. <laughs> okay? Look, I know that. Look, that's not in season today, is it? But that's reality. That is what the Word of God says. We are more valuable than the creatures who God takes care of. So why in the world are we going to take thought and hold those thoughts about our clothes, about cars, about this, about that, all this material stuff to be seen of men, which is just going to get corrupted. Look, anybody who's ever bought a car here, you know, maybe you got that vehicle of your choice, or, oh, man, this is awesome. Like, like when I got my truck, you know, that big truck that some of you still probably remember. Man, I was so happy for like two months. You know, <laughs> it was great. And then all the problems start to settle in, right? The things just start breaking and falling apart because it was a Dodge. You know? Don't get mad. That Cummins diesel engine's always going to be running, okay? But everything around that thing, it was just falling apart. And I start to get upset. And I start to realize there's nothing on this earth, I don't care how well designed it is, that's ever going to amount, that is ever going to be worth anything for your whole life. Except for maybe your spouse. But, you know, but honestly, they, won't com they don't compare at all to the treasures and to the rewards that you're going to get in heaven. Okay? Look at verse 27. It says, which of you, again, a rhetorical question here, which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto a stature? You, can you change your height? <laughs> are you, are you, you, know, you know, some people are like, well, I can take some steroids and add some cubit this way. You're not going to get bigger. I can, you know, that, that's true, you, you, but you're not going to get a cubit. I mean, you're going to get a couple inches in your biceps maybe or something. But what happens when you stop? <laughs> you go back to normal, right? You, you, you go back and then you might have all these issues. So Jesus is like, hey, which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to a stature? You're not going to be able to necessarily change the circumstances and change the way that the world works. So again, why are we going to sit here in, in, in worry? Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't know what's going on. I think it's very valuable that we understand what our political leaders are up to, right, and what the agenda is. I think that's very valuable. But are we going to take those thoughts and hold them and worry about that? And then 
go over to extreme worry, which is called anxiety. No, we're not going to do that. Okay? Why? Because if we take those thoughts and we meditate on them and we just hold them, we don't let them go, that becomes your treasure. That becomes what you're holding. That becomes what is valuable to you at that time. And it can either make you or it can break you. Look at verse 28. It says, and why, don't miss this again, and why take ye thought for raiment? Okay, why take thought for your clothing? Now, obviously, we all got to have clothes, and, you know, we want to look nice and things like that, but we don't want those things to have us, okay? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin, verse 29, and yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. So think about that for a second. Think about all the wisdom that Solomon had from God. Think about all the stuff. I mean, you want to talk about things to be measured. This guy measured everything. He's like, I applied my heart to no folly, to no wisdom. He's like, I didn't hold back anything. You know, that's what he said in Ecclesiastes. I don't hold back anything. And I got to see that pretty much life is a vexation. <laughs> you know, there's the whole point, hey, everything down here is going to stay here. doesn't matter in the end. The only thing that matters is God's way, his statutes, his righteousness, his salvation. That is what's important. But Jesus is telling us, hey, look at the flowers of the field. Look at how I take care of them. They don't have jobs, right? They're not out there shoveling. They're not out there working. And I still take care of them. And you're more valuable than them, right? Look at verse 29. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Verse 30, wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? So again, when you take the wrong thoughts that are bubbling up from your heart, and all of us have them, and you hold them, they become your treasure. It affects your faith, which you need, because we walk by faith, not by sight. Go to Mark chapter number 4. We're getting close to being done. I'm about to wrap this thing up here in just a moment. But again, let's go back to this question. Why is this found five times in this chapter? Take ye thought for raiment, or, or don't take this thought. Why are you guys taking these thoughts? Why is this found so often in the Bible? And it's because we have the choice. Again, we have the choice to take control of the thoughts that we want to dwell on. That's what it all boils down to. There's no magic pill. There's no magic recipe. There's no super secret to this. It's very obvious. It is a choice that you and I have. These, you, look, you're going to have wicked thoughts arise in your heart. Everyone does. Everyone. The question is, are you going to take and hold those thoughts? Because guess what? You also have a new man inside of you. You have the mind of Christ, and you can take those thoughts, and you can hold on to those. It's your choice. Mark chapter 14, look at verse 72. Mark 14, look at verse number 72. There's a story here about Peter. Remember Peter? What was Peter saying? Peter's kind of like this temperature sensor here, right? When everything was good, he was like, I'll be with thee. I won't, I won't deny thee, right? That resistance seemed good. It seemed like those electrons were flowing perfectly back to the motherboard. And Jesus is like, no, your thermistor has shorted. Your temperature sensor is out of range. Because what happened <laughs> ultimately when Christ was arrested? He got mad, he got offended. Look at verse 72, Mark 14, look at verse 72. And the second time, the cock crew, don't miss this, and Peter called to mind the word that Jesus said unto him. Before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice, meaning three times. And when he thought thereon, he wept. So notice in the time of adversity, when Peter finds himself in a situation where he's offended, he doesn't understand what's going on. Nothing makes sense to him. What does he do? This is why he was called to be an apostle. He called to mind the word that Jesus said unto him. That's the idea. That is what we all need to understand. Because you're going to go through tribulation in this life. You're going to have rough times. You're going to have things that happen to you that are beyond your control. And it needs to go back to this. Your mind needs to go, just like Peter. What did Peter do? 
He called to mind the word that Jesus had said unto him. Now, obviously, this isn't the ideal situation. Ideally, he would have just got the message and been like, oh, okay, your kingdom's spiritual now. I, I get it. We're not setting it up right now in the here and now. You know, we're not going to take down the Romans right now. I, I get it. That would have been ideal. But guess what? What's ideal is not always real. And we need to understand this is the solution. This is what Peter had inside of him. This is one of the reasons why Jesus chose him. Because when the going got tough, you know what he did? He dug down deep and he took the thoughts which were given to him by the word of God, by Jesus Christ. Go back, if you would, to Mark chapter number 12. Mark chapter number 12. Again, we have the choice which thoughts we are going to take. Now, you don't have the choice, unfortunately, though, to rip your heart out, <laughs> you know, and only have the new man inside you. you. You don't get that choice. And so, again, we as people, we kind of have it rough, don't we? We have to realize that every single day we have an internal battle. When you wake up, that battle starts. Oh, man, do I really need to go to church today? <laughs> you know that, that voice, that thought's in there like, there's two services, man, just sleep in, right? But guess what? If you, can't, if you give in to that, what happens next? There's four, maybe five Sundays a month. You know, depending on what month it is. You could just do that. And then the next thing you know, man, there's 365 days a year. You can go, you can go next week, right? And it just keeps going until you're out, until you're done. Mark chapter 12, look at verse 30. It says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God, with what? All thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. There's your three again. And with all thy strength, this is the first commandment. Why would Jesus say this if, if it's just all, only Calvinism? Well, God just designed some people to, you know, to, to just be great and worshiping Him and some not to be. It doesn't make any sense. It says, take free will. This is action. Go to 1 Peter chapter number 1. 1 Peter chapter number 1, and I'll prove it to you even further. So you say, what's the idea here? What in the world are you even talking about? I'm talking about the fact that we have the choice to take control of our thoughts. We can choose which thoughts we want to take, which ones we want to hold on to. Look at what Peter says here, 1 Peter chapter 1, in verse number 13. So he says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Go back to Matthew 6 and we'll finish up. It says, gird up the loins of your mind. This is a choice. You have the opportunity to do this. How do you do this, though? Well, let's go back to Matthew chapter number 6. And you remember, Peter heard the, this sermon. Peter was there at the Sermon on the Mount. He understood these things. And after the resurrection, obviously, when the Holy Ghost came, it all made sense. He's like, oh, okay, now I get it. So we're not setting up shop now. You know? <laughs> now it makes sense. Matthew 6, look at verse 31. Let's see, how do you do that? How do you gird up the loins of your mind? Well, it's right here. Matthew 6, look at verse 31. Therefore. Well, what does therefore mean? For that reason, right? For the reason that he just said. He said, hey, don't worry about these things. Don't take these thoughts. Don't grab them. Don't hold on to them. He says, therefore, take what? No thought. Take no thought saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? So he says, therefore, so because God takes care of creation, because it's less valuable, it says, therefore, take no thought. Because of that reason, don't take those thoughts. Look at verse 32. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of, these, of all these things. Look, he knows that we need clothing. He knows that we need vehicles. Yes, he knows that we need houses. We need shelter, all this stuff. He understands that, okay? So there's no need for us to take those thoughts on the material and make those things our treasure, which will then, what? Troll your thoughts and control your actions. Look at verse 33. Here's the application, and here is what we do. Two more verses, then we're going to go to Proverbs. We'll be done. Matthew 6, look at verse 33. Here's what you do. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Right? But seek ye first the kingdom of God. In other words, get your priorities right. 
Get your priorities straight, Christian. Oh, saved one, understand priorities. It's the kingdom of God. What can I do this week to further the kingdom of God? Can I go knock on someone's door and tell them the gospel? Can I go soul warning? Can I go soul winning? Can I read the Bible? Can I pray for a brother in Christ? What can I do to further the kingdom of God? Once that's your attitude, once you make that decision to take those thoughts because you have the mind of Christ, you have the new man, guess what? All these other things will be added unto you. You know, when we had this, these, these protesters out here, right, guess what? Nobody in here was taking thought. Like, oh, man, I didn't hear one person like, man, except for maybe me, like, I'm going to lose my job, you know? <laughs> And, and, and even though I thought I was, I was like, I'll just get another one, right? I wasn't like super worried about it. In fact, I preached like five more sermons about the subject. But, you know, you know that's just, just my job. It is what it is, right? But none of us in here were like, oh, man, maybe this isn't for me, man. Maybe, maybe we should just tell pastor to put a lid on it and just preach love only. You know? Nobody in here had that. And almost everyone in here has had some kind of a promotion or some kind of an increase, some kind of a blessing. In fact, I'm pretty sure that everybody in here has had some kind of a blessing since that happened. Right? But what was the devil out there saying? We're coming back every week. We're going to do this to you. We're going to do that to you. And oh man, we're going to put your pictures out there and blah, blah, blah. Empty threats. We didn't take those thoughts. They tried to put those thoughts into our minds and we suppressed them. We said, no, we're going to take this. We're going to take the word of God. We're going to take the promises. We're going to take the fact that we're going to put the kingdom of God first. And then all these things will be added unto us. And that's exactly what happened exactly to a T what happened. Look at verse 34. Take no thought. Take, I'm sorry, take therefore no thought for the morrow. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Look, every day that you wake up and you turn your news app on or whatever, you get a notification for the news. Hopefully you don't dwell on the news. But guess what? It's always evil. You get that little notification on your phone. You know, I don't even know how to get rid of half of them. But it's like, it's always like, oh, you know, just, just something wicked. It's never like, oh, you know, something good. Like five people got saved yesterday. Or it's never anything like that. It's always evil. So again, don't understand that. And don't take those thoughts and make them your dwelling. Make them your consideration. Make them your treasure. Okay? It's not going to, uh, what are you going to change? Real change is by churches like this. They have the right Bible and the right gospel and aren't afraid to preach the truth. That's where real change comes from. And obviously the media knows that. Obviously the devil knows that. Otherwise, we wouldn't have made the news. <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't be the most hated man in Idaho. Okay? Go to Proverbs 15 and we will be done. Proverbs 15 and we will be done. So again, not to pound this title home, but the title of the sermon is When Thought Whispering Goes Wrong. Okay? When Thought Whispering Goes Wrong. How does that work? Well, it goes wrong when you think you're strong enough to take those thoughts. Take those thoughts that you know you shouldn't be taking, and you like, I'm just going to dwell on these because I just feel like being mad. I catch myself doing that from time to time. Thinking about things in the past that have you know, gone wrong or where people have wronged me, and I'll just sit there and I'll be like, oh, man, I hope I can see that person. And what am I doing here? I just wasted like 10 minutes of my life just staring at the computer when I'm supposed to be writing a sermon, and here I am thinking about things that happened 15 years ago. You know, I mean, look, I'm just being honest with you. These things happen, okay? It's unprofitable, though. That's the whole point. You know, the Bible says, can one go upon hot coals and not, in, you know, and not have his feet burned? And you know the answer to that. The answer is no. You want to play with fire, you're getting burnt. It's just the way that it is. just a matter of time, the Bible says. So when thought whispering goes wrong is the title here. But let's go back to where we kind of first started. Proverbs 15, look at verse 30. The Bible says, The light of the eyes rejoiceth the heart, and don't miss this, and a good report maketh the bones fat. You know, the Bible says that everything that's written therein. is written for our learning. It's written for our admonition. It's written for our education. It's written to be a blessing to us. Okay. So uh, think about that. A good report maketh the bones fat. This is why we have the prayer and praise time, praise time on Wednesdays. This is why we encourage you to write down a praise, something that God has done for you in your life, and to put that in the box or put that in the plate that goes by so that we can rejoice with you. This has a, uh, a tremendous effect on your physical health. 
Think about it. You know, people that are always negative, oh, everything's just always wrong. You, what you're going to find a lot of times with those people is they have health issues. Look at verse 31. He says this, The ear that heareth the reproof of life abideth among the wise. Okay? So, as believers, obviously, we want to take these thoughts, the thoughts that arise from this book that go down into our hearts, and we want to pull from those just like Peter did. Verse 32, he that refuseth instruction despiseth his own soul, but he that heareth reproof getteth understanding, right? So never be afraid of some correction, of some reproof. And guess what? This is a giant book of reproof for all of us, okay? Don't be afraid of it. Oh, he's making me paranoid. No, man, wrong attitude. Wrong attitude. Look at verse 33. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. So if you want to have true honor, the only way that's going to happen, believer, is if you are humble. Look at, verse, uh, look at the next verse, 16.1. It says, The preparations of the heart in man, and the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. Okay, that, that there is just a, I mean, I could talk about that all day long. Somebody comes up to you, man, I'm super wise, and they're just telling you how smart they are, and this and that and the other thing. You know, you need to be listening. Is there any wisdom from the Bible coming out of that mouth? Is there any word of God coming from that mouth? Because if not, you need to be careful. There's something going on. Look at verse 2. All the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes, but the Lord weigheth the spirits. Right? Go read the book of Judges and then meditate on that verse. <laughs> you know? Every man did that which was right in his own eyes in those days. Guess what? We're back to those times in this country. It sure seems like it. Look at verse 3 and we're done. Again, this backs up the application in uh, Matthew 6, 34. What does he say? Commit, commit, commit thy works unto the Lord. And what? Thy thoughts shall be established. So how do I take control of my thoughts? I commit my works unto the Lord, and then He will establish my thoughts. Okay, that is what I'm talking about. The, your treasures will troll your thoughts. And if you just want to heap up unto yourselves these treasures of the world and materialistic goods and power and blah, 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 so on and so forth. Look, I'm not trying to be rude. I'm just simply telling you you're going to have trouble. You will lose rewards, which is a big theme in this chapter here. God wants us to get to heaven with a lot of rewards and just, I mean, the glory that he, He's going to give us. Right? Why would you want to sacrifice that for a few moments of people patting you on the back and telling you how good you are? Right? Those are thoughts we don't want to take. You know, except, hey, thanks a lot. Amen. You know, great. Time to move on. Right? How do you take control of your thoughts? You commit your ways into the Lord. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. It's Him first. That's it. Bible, church, pray. You know, those are your priorities. Your thoughts will be established, and it's not going to be overnight. You're going to have struggles. You're going to have these battles. But if you get your priorities right, your thought life will change. We see it all the time. I'm done. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Thank you so much, Lord, for your truths in the Bible. Once again, I just pray that you would help every single one of us, Lord, to remember the main application here, Lord, that we choose which thoughts we want to take. You've given us your mind. Please help us to take the thoughts from your word and to dwell and to meditate on those things and make those our treasure, Lord, that we may be successful in the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.